years ago, I went to the writers' uh, week in Adelaide in Australia, and I ended up in the mythology and fairy tale tent with other people. And Chinua Achebe was there, the Nigerian writer. And so there was three, or four of us with Chinua, and we were talking about myth. So Chinua began this way. He said, "Now you people in the West, you know, you're always insulting mythology. You don't understand it." You're always saying things like it's only a myth. Now, I want to tell you a myth. You also, yeah, I'll tell you another thing you do is talk about the myth of racial superiority. Now, that's not a myth, it's a theory. You're slandering myth again by saying that. Now, I want to tell you the difference between the myth and the theory. In my country, they have a myth that the entire globe and everything in it was made out of a single drop of milk. Now, if you believe that, it doesn't hurt anyone. But the theory of racial superiority is a theory that has killed and harmed thousands and thousands of people in your country and in mine. So please remember the difference. That's very good. A theory is a mental construct. And we can't get it straight. We're insisting on calling it a myth. So a myth is something that has truth much deeper than any theory, and as we were saying today, it belongs in the area of the irrational. So therefore, the rational mind that we're trained with resists it and insists on insulting it and loves to insult it and loves to say, well, the myth of, uh, the myth of uh, Bush's invincibility, what are you talking about? Myth has nothing to do with Bush. We didn't even get near 50 miles of Bush. <laughs> so... It's interesting how our misuse of language will represent, will show exactly where we are. So, um, so uh, Joseph used to say that uh, that the energies that are described in myth are from the other world, and they come down here, and as soon as they enter, they enter the world of time which is also the world of opposites evil and good right and left politically right and left you hear that um, and all of these opposites we live in in this world but but uh, the energy itself it, it is not in the world of opposites so that uh, the other day I met a woman, uh, for example, and she was very angry about the description of uh, God as he in the Bible. And I said, yeah, I think there's some truth in it. And, and I said, I once did a version of the Lord's Prayer for, uh, you know, for the mother goddess. And she was interested in that. So we were talking this way, you know, about describing God as she sometimes. Then there's an older woman standing next to her, and she said, no, you're both wrong, because it's not a he or a she. She said to the feminist, you're just as far off as the other ones are. Because it's an it. And you're slandering God whenever you say she. Or whenever you say he. But even it is a slander, right? Because even it has a form, isn't it, right? So Joseph would say all that all the time. But what is coming down here has no opposite. And it has no form. When it enters our world, it takes form. When it enters our world, it takes opposites. So therefore... It's a hard thing to talk about. And he used to say, God is not a father. Please understand that. If you argue about God being a father, you're speaking literally. Our relationship to God is as a son's or daughter's relationship to the father. It is metaphorical. We have, just like we've lost mythology, we've lost the ability to think uh, metaphorically. And toward the end of his life, he would say, I've been thinking about the whole thing of mythology. I think it's all metaphor. Every bit of it. And we can't think me uh, metaphorically anymore. Only a few can think metaphorically. So we get into fights as to whether God is a father or not. The issue is not being a father. Can you think metaphorically? Can you think? See, there's two ways to look at God. One is that it's a ball of white hot energy so terrific that if you got near it you die in a fraction of a second that's one way of thinking about it that includes its dangerous terrifying completely inhuman quality can you feel that 
Some religions, especially so-called primitive people, will try to hold that. It's a ball of pure fire. It's beyond good, evil, anything. The very idea is ridiculous compared to a, a ball of electricity. And others try to bring it into the human sphere by comparing it to a mother or a father. God is, metaphorically, is like uh, a mother who brings forward a child without any father. That is metaphorically what it's like. But the fundamentalists won't accept that and they keep saying that Mary's in hymen was intact and they checked it and they know it's intact. So if you say it isn't, they're going to fight. So one of the things that Joseph said is inability to understand metaphors results in war. Angry people are people who cannot understand metaphor. That's wild, don't you think so? He says, neither the Jews nor the Arabs can understand metaphor anymore. Jesus was not born in Palestine, nor Mohammed there. They both were born in sacred ground, in sacred time, which is nowhere. Well, you understand how much trouble he could get into saying this kind of thing. And he did. The fundamentalists absolutely hated him. As they hated Jung. You know, Jung was always answering letters from furious Catholic priests <laughs> who insisted he didn't have a spark of religion in him. The truth is that Jungianism is the greatest gift to Protestantism that's ever been done. If the Protestants had any brains at all, they could revive their entire church with Jung. But they're too, you know, they're too non-metaphorical, so... Anyone want to say anything to me now? I don't want to be just ra rave on all the time. So please speak. Do you agree with all this stuff I'm saying? When, when did we become illiterate, metaphorically? Yeah, it's interesting. I was thinking when you were asking that question and so on, of this thing that comes up in studying fairy tales, namely, what is a witch? In the fairy tales, in general, in the, in the Grimm Brothers fairy tales, there are witches, giants, and dwarves. Now, all three of those are from the other world. We experience uh, witches as hostile beings with a feminine tone. We experience giants as hostile beings with a masculine tone. And then there are dwarfs who in general are helpful. They tend to have a masculine tone. But, so, what is a witch? Well, you know, many traditions say that the witch is an extremely powerful force in the universe that comes in whenever you start to make any spiritual growth. She comes in, and people have experienced it. They go into a meditation workshop, and everything goes wonderfully for three or four weeks. They feel better. They're eating better. Everything's good. All of a sudden, uh, you get kicked out of your apartment. Your car breaks down. First, your battery goes, and then the radiator goes, and then your girlfriend leaves you, and so on and so on and so on. And this is just a fact of human life that's been observed again and again and again. Mythologically, it means that the witch has been activated when she saw that you were in danger of growing. And she moves in to block you as much as possible. And either you gain enough energy to overcome her or you quit. She doesn't care which. Because she's a guardian of the real spiritual areas. And she doesn't want wimps in there. Is that clear what you're saying? So at the end of the story, it turns out that the witch was the greatest friend of Ivan or the Snow White or whatever. Because without the witch, uh, the, the, the hero of the fairy story would have just been a flat New Age person <laughs> for the rest of their lives, eating yogurt and brown rice. <laughs> the witch doesn't want that. Either intensity or check out. Huh? Who's, who wants to object to what I'm saying? So I'd love to tease the New Age people, but there's something revoltingly bland about New Age people. <laughs> so <clears throat> the witch eats them usually just as a matter of course, without even asking any of their opinions. <laughs> so this is true. Most of the Nestle have been eaten. A lot of people here have been eaten. The witch then insists on intensity, and you're developing enough harshness and non-New Age. Ah! 
That kind of drive. You can see it in Michael sometimes. Can you see it in his face? <laughs> and the people in the other world are balls of fire. And you better have some of that stuff if you want to deal with them. Okay. So therefore, the witch then is considered to have come down as inside of you. The witch can be considered that part of you that tries to block all of your growth. Is that clear? Now, we know that the ability to think mythologically had disappeared by about 1200 because the Catholic priests started burning witches about that time. That means that the Catholic priests could not tell uh, a being from the other world from one down here using herbs. So, the idea is that the witch is not a person. <coughs> the witch is a force that comes from the other world and is inside you. Now, the chances are that the priests had accepted the rationalistic view of the personality. They received communion, they received this, they don't have any shadow, is that right? They cannot deal with their own shadow part, either their giant or their witch. They can't deal with it. It's, she's got it. She's the wicked one. She's causing the trouble. Something like nine women were burned for every man at that time. There were uh, villages in France in which every woman over 30 was burned to death. That's how powerful the failure of uh, mythological thinking was in the Catholic Church. It's unbelievable when you look at it. So, uh, Gioia Timpanelli would say, you know, a pre uh, religions are ruined by false priests. By ignorant priests, they say in Buddhism. Religions are ruined by ignorant priests. Priests unable to think mythologically. Well, see, Joe has said, look it, you got in trouble immediately when you said Jesus was born at 1 AD. You collapsed the world. You want to go on with this a little bit? Yeah. Okay, let's do one more and then we'll go on to these things here. Just to help us with the poems we're going to do. Over here, I want to separate three kinds of thinking. Over here, I want to do literal thinking and fundamentalist thinking. Okay? Over here, I want to do psychological thinking. Over here, mythological thinking. We think that myth is behind us. It isn't. It's ahead of us. Around 1899, people moved from concrete and fundamentalist thinking to psychological thinking. That was the year that Freud published Interpretation of Dreams. Before that, the people in St. Asylums were considered to be possessed, and they did it, didn't they? Somebody did it to them and... Lock them up. Lock them up. What else would you say about that? What is your attitude towards people like uh, criminals? What do you say to do with them? Lock them up. Right. Kill them. Kill them. Right, it's clear, isn't it? Head on. Right. Burn their book. Oh, wow. Get their family. <laughs> oh, yeah. So let's let's just take the virgin birth now. Who and run it through. The one that looks like them. <laughs> <laughs> you see how easy it is to fall into it? Jesus. It's such fun, too, you know? Energy rises in your body. You're going to clean the closet. Finally! <laughs> so this is a closet cleaning mentality over here. Because it says it right here. <laughs> <laughs> and I know Hebrew, right? And I know. So um, it's been... Huh? <laughs> it's very interesting, by the way. There's a new book on Moby Dick. And it's done by a brilliant guy out in Colorado. And, you know, at the time around 1800, 1830, there's incredible articles in the Boston paper about the Old Testament. They were beginning to study it, really, for the first time. And they found something very disturbing about the Old Testament, that the more they studied it, the more the sex, Christian sex broke up. Because there wasn't a unity in the Old Testament. And they'd get hooked on this, and all these churches would split. And apparently, in Moby Dick, you remember, there's a gold doubloon nailed to the mast. And apparently, Melville meant that as the Old Testament. Everyone has a different opinion about the Old Testament, about what the gold doubloon is. They all go down, by the way. <laughs> Except for Ishmael, who has a generalist view. Isn't that good? They think they can identify the statements that these people make about the gold doubloons by reading those articles in the Boston papers that Melville was, was reading. Fantastic, fantastic. <laughs> Everybody goes down here when the real stuff comes. Okay.
We take the virgin birth. What is the virgin birth? The virgin birth is the fact, like we have mentioned it earlier, that Mary's hymen was intact. Is that right? Sure. Absolutely. Did she do it or not? She didn't. she didn't do it. I think she did it. What do you think I should say? What do you want to say to me? You're out of town. <laughs> Well, come on, be reasonable about it. Don't you think it's possible with Joseph? With Joseph? Come on. Okay. I know where you come from. But I'm a nice person. I got a good education. I'm sorry. But you're going to have You eggheads all alike. You eggheads? Right, you all alike. All right. Over here, about 10 years ago, a beautiful. Uh, understanding of the virgin birth came about uh, when understood psychologically. And it's meant quite a bit to, to women that I know. Um, now, psychologically, what, uh, what is a virgin psychologically? You don't need anyone but yourself. Another way to put it is that a virgin is a woman who does not need to be completed by a man. And to some extent by society, I think. So the phrasing has come, a, wo a virgin is a woman who is complete unto herself and does not mean need to be completed by a man. Now, I was uh, teaching with Marion Woodman a couple of weeks ago, and she makes the virgin the center of what she's doing. That a virgin is a woman with integrity. And so one moves toward a virgin when you stop lying. It has nothing to do with your age and who you make love with. When you can go into that place in which you're not trying to appeal to men or lie to society or be in the golf course and say the right things, be in parties and try... You understand all of that. All of that's non-virgin material. And at a certain point, a woman can, can come into an area and Mary, Marion is really in that area. She's had three or four kids and she's getting more and more like a virgin every day and there's a courage in her that just goes right down. I mean, when you listen to her talk, it's interesting. It just goes right towards the truth. And that's that virgin quality. So psychologically then, a virgin is a person, a woman who is whole unto herself um, and therefore can deal in the area of truth. Okay? Isn't that a different matter? There's a certain forgiveness enters with a psychological point of view. Do you hear it? Understanding happens. All that stuff that you guys live with, suddenly it isn't useful anymore. You asked for some imaginative leap. You understand me? It's so beautiful, the psychological thinking. Why does she have to be a woman? No, no, and that's good. Same. Good answer. I mean, but the word virgin, if you look it up in a dictionary, also says a virgin is a woman who was uh, living in the temples as a religious person and did dances in the temple all the time. Now, that's also a psychological understanding of the word virgin, and it says Christ's mother was a virgin. That means on the female side, his, his, his mother and grandmother had probably been temple dancers. That's a big, heavy difference there. And Christ's father was a carpenter. We know that many of the Essenes and the people of that area traveled around at that time nomadic, making their living by carpentry. And the word carpenter was a code word, meaning they belonged to a traveling Essene group. Christ's father was a carpenter. But... And did you guys believe that? Oh, no, he dealt with two-by-fours. It's the same as I used to get in Sunday school. He used to, wasn't it wonderful? Jesus was there working with two-by-fours. And uh, what a wonderful thing. Here he is with Joseph. Uh, you know, That's same literal again, isn't it? To look for the symbolic, uh, essential quality of it is involved in the psychological thinking. Jesus' father was a carpenter, and his mother was a virgin. Two heavy streams came right together like that. All right. Now, uh, now there's an interface between psychological thinking and mythological thinking. It's just as important as that 1899 one. And a lot of, there's troubles with the psychological thinking, too. First of all, it tends to be passionless. It tends to be full of jargon. You ever read Freudian jargon? You ever read Jungian jargon? There's something soupy about it. Something can be really in the head. You know, we're just talking about the disadvantages of it. I think it's a great step. But the, the reason it has, I mean, the reason that a lot of therapists I know are so sick of the words they've been saying for years, they're trying to move over to the, to the story. To the story. To the story. They'd rather tell their clients stories. And they do. 
That's why the fairy tale is returning as a form of thought. Okay, now let's do the virgin birth mythologically. What is the virgin birth mythologically? Make some guesses. New birth or salvation? That's a noun, okay? We've got two nouns now. We've got salvation and new birth. She's getting better. She's getting into story. Go on. What is the Phoenix story? Oh, a bird that uh, lets itself be burned up and then rises anew from the ashes. See, she's getting into it here. What is a mythological version of the virgin birth? She says, there was once a bird that allowed itself to be burned up and then rose from the ashes. This is absolutely right. A story has to be told over here. I'll give you one more hint. In mythological thinking... It's got to be inside your body. Remember, in mythology, Christ was not born at any one time. So in mythological thinking, everything is always taking place. That means it takes place inside you because you're the speaker. Joseph would say, when I am lecturing, out of my heart is born every second impulses and poems and thoughts and none of them have any father or husband so you see these little things that had happened to him you could see it on his face when he talked it isn't that it was because he read Spengler they didn't happen that way they don't have any father or husband they just come out of the heart <laughs> So when you're looking at the Virgin Mary and, and that thing is penetrating into her womb and there's going to be a baby there, it's the same thing. It's happening to us. Isn't that beautiful? Yes. So in the mythological then, our own body is a temple. And of course that's exactly what Blake said. The human body is a temple. All right, so we go now. I want to talk about this 12th century thing. And I like the introduction we had. It was a little long, but what the hell. Are you ready? Now, um, I don't know how much of this you know about the history of that time. But the Gnostics were defeated by the Christian church. The great work on the Gnostics is being done partly by uh, Gilles Kispel, who is a, a son of a blacksmith in um, Holland, and he is a friend of Jung's. And I heard him the other day on a tape talking about May 10th, 1952, when he went to a middleman and he bought the, what's called the Jung Codex, which is a series of Gnostic writings from a middleman, an Arab middleman that had been hidden for 1900 years. And he, he had in his hand in this restaurant uh, in, in uh, Brussels, he had looking for the first time by someone who could read it, this doctrine, this work. One of them by Valentinus, who was the greatest of the Gnostics. And nothing had ever survived by Valentinus before. Because the Christians hated them so much that they only mocked them when they spoke. Everything we knew about the Gnostics was from uh, Christian church fathers mocking them. So why were they so angry at the Gnostics? Well, several uh, things, uh, uh, Valentinus, for example, said, and I'll just give it to you in uh, Gilles Kispel's, uh, uh, I think as I heard it on the tape. Uh, it says, unless a man has loved a woman in such a way as to become one with her, he can never enter the spiritual world. The Gnostics were not sex haters and women haters. That reminds you of what was found in 1899. A little statement of Christ was found uh, in the desert, and Simon Peter said to Jesus, Why do you kiss us on the cheeks, but you kiss Mary Magdalene on the lips? His answer was, Because I kiss Mary Magdalene on the lips. <laughs> Perfect Zen answer. <laughs> but Mary Magdalene then is held near Jesus because she holds all of that power of sexuality and of matter and of... Uh, is that clear? And the last statement in the Gospel of Thomas, which they also found, is Simon Peter, same one. Simon Peter says, Tell Mary I'm to leave the room because women are not worthy of the kingdom. 
Now you know that was said many times at that time. A lot of those old Jews were great female haters. Tell Miriam to leave the room because women are not worthy of the kingdom. And Jesus said, listen, do you see this girl, this woman? I'm going to bring out the male in her. And when I bring that out, she will not be two anymore. She will be one. And then she'll enter the kingdom long before you. That's the last thing in the Gospel of Thomas. So we're dealing here with, uh, uh, with um, material which uh, was heavily Gnostic in uh, the way Jesus dealt with it, which was then sanitized and rubbed out by St. Paul and St. Augustine until we've got uh, a religion that's female-hating and sex-hating. Is that clear? St. Paul and St. Augustine. Uh -huh. I remember there's a man uh, named Matthew Fox who does creation-centered spirituality instead of sin-centered spirituality, huh? Pope is thinking of excommunicating him soon. But anyway, he used to have a, a center in Chicago, and I would go there once a year and read Kabir and Rumi and so on. And a lot of the people were ex-nuns and ex-priests. They were the most marvelous audience you'd ever seen. They were getting MAs. And uh, I gave a poet, I'd give a poetry reading every night beforehand. And one time I was giving a poetry reading and, and attacking St. Paul, you know, and stuff. As a Lutheran, I was damaged enough by St. Paul. I have the right to attack him. So I was attacking him and, you know, something. Matt came out with me afterwards and put his arm around me and he said, listen, Robert, it's good, but you got the wrong man. Augustine's the one. <laughs> and I said, you ought to know. You're Catholic. You ought to know. He said, I know. Augustine is the one. So, then what happened then is that this material, which had been, which the Christians killed, it, you know, the Sufis have the similar relationship to the Mohammedans as the Gnostics had to us. And the Muslims let the Sufis live. We did not let the Gnostics live. Some survived, Jewish and Gnostics survived in a small community in the Mesopotamia in the old area of Babylon, and they're still there. They are Jewish Christians with some of the original texts. Uh, but in Europe, they were all killed, and when the witchcraft stuff went on, they were completely wiped out. So Gilles Kispel says, there are no living Gnostics left anymore, but it revived immediately, uh, wholeheartedly, out of Jacobema in about 1520, and then uh, Jung, who was probably a rebirth of one of the killed Gnostics. <laughs>